The future of college basketball and college football could be decided here in the coming days and weeks. According to Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports, we'll break that down. We'll also talk about Big 12 basketball from last night. Texas scoring another big victory on the road against Oklahoma. Longhorns are back in business. Houston, three straight victories as well. We'll break that all down on today's show. This is the Big 12 Watch. I'm your host, Josh Neighbors, here on Crystal Ball College Football. We are part of the 365 Sports Network. You guys can find us wherever you get your podcast and here on YouTube as well. All right, so yeah, today's uh, today's business is about an article Ross Dellinger wrote, put it on Twitter, amid legal suits, threats of NCAA secession, discord over Project D1, and congressional delays, Charlie Baker, the Power Five commissioners, meet this week in Washington, D.C. to chart a course forward. Will they go together or apart? We're running out of time, is what he says. So he says, uh, on December 5th, the Washington, and uh, this is from Washington, by the way, on December 5th, NCAA President Charlie Baker unveiled a somewhat radical proposal to modernize college athletics in a model that included direct pay to athletes and the creation of a new subdivision. The college athletics world reacted to Project D1 in a variety of ways. While a surprise to many, it was mostly met with fanfare for its progressive and bold approach. But some question both its rollout, if you knew the intimate details, and its sustainability as a long-term solution for the industry's primary issue. How to better compensate college athletes. Nearly two months after Project D1's grand reveal, some of the targets at the center of the proposal, schools in the Power 5, or better yet, Power 2, are not in support of the plan. There is disagreement on the proposal's implementation. Discord about the NCAA's future in general, Growing doubts around congressional action, a necessary component of the proposal, and most notably further discussion of NCAA secession from schools residing at the highest level of the sport. Bits it all, one of the most challenging times in college athletics history, most powerful executives in the sport, the Power Five commissioners, gather this week in the nation's capital. They are scheduled to meet on Thursday with Baker in a gathering, perhaps to further explore their differences and chart a course together or apart toward rectifying the various unresolved issues. Uh, so I'll tell you all this, you know, obviously football is going to drive this bus, but because the NCAA tournament is a billion dollar industry, that will too. I think the most likely situation here is we think conferences do their best to gain control of NCAA basketball and college football. I mean, functionally, this important point in time, guys, it, it feels like the conferences in a lot of ways are calling the shots when it comes to football. Think about the, uh, you know, the way that the college ball playoff is there. Like that's not an NCAA sanctioned event, right? Um, that is a TV thing. That is a conferences type deal. They are the ones who have decided on all of that, right? The NCAA is there, but like, this is a, uh, them deal. Uh, the NCAA tournament is still theirs too. Yes. But if we're talking about money making enterprises being governed by the conferences, would make sense you go the same direction with football and you know and basketball. Uh, the one thing the NCAA does have is they do a very good job, I think at least in my opinion, of running NCAA championships for the non-revenue sports or some are revenue, but some schools. But generally speaking, the ones that we do consider non-revenue, uh, you know, women's basketball, baseball, softball, track and field, whatever else you want to hockey, whatever else you want to put in there, right? So um, they do a good job with those. Uh, does the NCAA hang around in some kind of capacity to manage those? I think is a big question. But like, why would you allow the NCAA to dictate what you can do moving forward? You could use them as some kind of enforcement agency, but here's the thing, guys. Their enforcement's not been that impressive, right? It's been haphazard. It has been inconsistent. And because of that inconsistency, I think it's fair to ask, like, why do we need them? The punishments have not been, uh, they're not standardized, right? They kind of just want layups when it comes to enforcement. And, you know, a lot of times if you challenge some of the stuff that they do, like a lot of teams, you know, a lot of schools rather, programs have lawyered up and shut up and won and beat them. And also, you know, challenging uh, things like the transfers in court, right? They were able to get a, you know, a, a restraining order against the NCAA because the thing is, like, they can't tell you how often or where you can transfer to. You're not, you're not an employee, 
And, you know, the way Bud Elliott described it on cover three, and he's he has got a law degree, like courts don't like non-compete clauses as it is for professional sports or, you know, in, in, in any professional industry. They will especially not like it when it's kids who are not actual uh, employees. They are student athletes, as they call them, right? But when you're making money off the backs of these these kids, these players, and look like yeah, they might be able to make some of their own now, NIL. Yeah, but they're still not actually seeing the direct revenue. Like the television revenue that the conferences get is not being distributed to the players. That's not how this is working. And so because of that, I think we you know have to realize like the players aren't seeing any of that money directly. And that is why this is happening. You know, the colleges and the conferences want to keep expanding things like the playoff and the tournament. You know why? Because the NCAA tournament rates well and the college football playoff rates well. So why would you have three college football playoff games when you could have, I think I counted the other day, four in the first round, four in the second round, two in the, uh, the semifinal, one in the championship. That's 11. That's eight more games than you had previously. That is eight more television events. That is eight more millions of sets of eyes. That is eight more opportunities, obviously, to have advertisers come in, to work with bowl teams, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so that is something that I think we have to note, uh, is, is that you know it, it makes a ton of sense that they would want to do this. And you have to like ask, what is the function of the NCAA? What, it, what can they still provide the conferences to make it worthwhile? And as Ross says, as the football offseason arrives, college sports stands at the most significant inflection point in its more than 100 years of history. Mounting legal challenges, some with billion-dollar price tags, threaten to bankrupt the sport. An unruly transfer portal, NIL landscapes, and football and basketball rosters into a tizzy. The tether between major college, uh, college athletics and higher education continues to wear thin. Further complicating matters. College athletics' existence, as we know it, hinges on a governing body even slower than its own. Congress. Meanwhile, the industry's own leaders uh, originating from differing geographic and cultural footprints with wide variation in resources struggle to find consensus, both among themselves with the 100, uh, you know, 117 year association presides over them, all the while as commissioners and Baker are scheduled to meet the legal challenges against the NCAA and conference uh, conference, you know, says, provide leaders with a ticking clock. Uh, let's say Jerry Moorhead is the president of Georgia and chair of the division one board of directors running out of time. So I, I agree with that. And there's a lot more here from Ross. Um, I think what we need to unpack, you know, also is, is the fact that the conferences will meet legal challenges too, but, but the difficult part for them becomes now you've got to basically set up an infrastructure and in a system. that's not there. Right. So if you're going to pay these players and like basically just make them employees, uh, how much school is going to happen, I think, is a big question. And along with school, what does the calendar look like is a big question, right? Because if school is included, well, the problem with the portal is that like you need to go to class and kids just, you know, you, January class has started again. And I remember being in school. It wasn't too long ago. Two weeks, I think, was the ad drop time for classes so like if you have if you have a winter semester, you're actually in pretty good shape because kids, don't, you know, if like if you have the January term, whatever, uh, you know, you take one class, whatever it is, like kids could skip that and show up when the spring happens in February or whatever that starts. But like if you start in January, man, like kids can't sit in the portal forever, right? If you're a Bama player, you know, you need to kind of make up your mind here pretty quickly about whether you're going to stay or whether you're going to go because you need to find a new school need to enroll in that school and look, it's a big decision. You know, these, these, these kids are making big decisions about their lives and their future. And, and once again, the, you know, the NIL part of this now too. And I think the payment part of this in general is these kids, not all of them will go to the NFL like a Will Rogers, right? I don't know if he's going to have a nice NFL career. Um, you know, take take your pick of, of quarterbacks around here, right? Like Will Howard might have a crappy season this year and his draft stock might plummet. But the thing is, Will Howard was good enough to earn himself some big money at Ohio State. I was at that Cotton Bowl, guys. They they are going to be loaded next year, but they could not run out that same quarterback they had last time. So what am I saying with all this? Kids' ability to make money playing these sports has just increased, particularly in football. These football players now have a much, much better chance 
of making of capitalizing rather off their football careers because of NIL and also because you know they get paid too they can and also the violence of football the violence of football basically ensures that it's not going to be a long career that you're going to have a lot of guys do have nice long careers uh, most of them don't generally speaking right a lot of these guys don't they don't have long awesome you know great careers and sometimes not you know not even healthy lives so your ability to make money to provide for your family you know i know that uh, ad mitchell said you know i can pay for my daughter to go to daycare with nil money like we see kids in lambos and a lot of people here are bitching you know in arkansas bitching about kj jefferson's clothes like but you do realize there are people who are doing good things with their money too i mean it, it also it's your money you get to spend it however you want to right that's 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 a big part of this so it it's it's a great opportunity for those kids. And then also for basketball, too, guys, NIL's helping out hoops. There are a lot of guys who left way too early in college basketball for the NBA draft and did not get drafted or went second round or had to go play in Europe. And the reason why they did is because, like, they just wanted to go make some money playing ball. And in college, they might get paid under the table, whatever it is, but, like, you're not making a substantial amount, you know, amount now. And now the transfer portal, NIL and whatnot, guys can do that. Once again, said, well, Josh, uh, NIL is not supposed to be you know, luring kids away. Yeah, I mean, but like still, that, that's that's not the reality of it, though. It's not it's most recruiting fights. You know, some's coaching. Yeah, some are, you know, the assistants, you know, some are fit and how close to home. But it still have a lot of big recruiting fights were money before we had NIL. So I think we have to understand that, too. You know, this is the reality that we're going at. And these players, guys, they're going to get paid. If, if the greed from the conferences, and I'm not saying it's bad greed. I mean, everything in this country, every single like business, you want to maximize profits. So I understand why conferences and conference commissioners and presidents and ADs and you know assistant ADs and football coaches want to keep making more and more money because their bottom lines will go up. But if you're just going to be in pursuit of that cash, if that's what matters here, then you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to become gross when we don't pay the players. That, that's that's just absolutely the, the truth. It's just going to become like, you know, disgusting that, that, that these kids are the ones out there actually putting their athletic careers on the line, you know, health and well-being on the line sometimes and uh, not able to do so, you know, not able to make some of that money. And that, that's it's going to happen as they keep going uh, along. But once again, I encourage you all to go read uh, these articles, uh, this article from Ross Dellinger, I always encourage you all to read it. He goes on more and more. He talks about, Hey, the meetings, the ACC and the big 12 were described as, uh, you know, battle compared to the meetings held with the big 10 Baker's hour long in-person meeting with the big 10 commissioner or big, big 10 administrators last week in Chicago turned into a real for, proverbial airing of the grievances about the plan itself. So people have some issues about the plan, the permits, you know, the way it does NIL, um, you know, it's allowing the schools to strike them directly with the athletes, which is interesting. The subdivision for FBS, how much they're paying the players and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I think um, I think free market will kind of take over on some of this stuff. But it does bring up the concern because for the Big 12, if you're a Big 12 fan, you start to think, like, what is our place in all of this? If it's all going to be about the top two leagues, the SEC and the Big 10, and once again, I think – on its surface, it sounds good, but I would caution them against it. I would, and, and look, I cover the Big 12. It's great. All right. I, I, I know it's, it's fine. But like, I mean, I think it's bad for the industry. I think it's bad for the sports if we just go and we go towards the pro model. Like if you're just straight up, like there, there is an in-between, right? There is an in-between where we can create, like people will watch these playoff games. There's an the opportunity to make money. Right, but it does not just have to be the big brands the entire time. It, one, I, I'll keep making this point, y'all. If you cut off a bunch of fan bases in college football, like you're going to hurt the sport. College football is not the best product when it comes to football. But so I like it more. Yeah, well, the ratings don't tell us that. The ratings tell us that you all out there, and myself included, you know, everybody as Americans. We like pro football more than we like college football, right? Uh, you know, that the LSU Alabama game last year today, you know, 10 million people, right? Chiefs, Bills, ratings. The Chiefs, Bills, ratings that CBS, at least the ones that CBS put out, and, you know, you can talk about that, hey. But 50 million people. And let's just even, let's even spot and say, you know, it wasn't 50, it was, it was 40. 40 million people watched that game in the playoffs. 
I mean, and, and what a great number that is, right? Let's see who and how many watched Alabama, uh, Michigan ratings. Let's see how many people watch that game. 27.2, right? That is one of the final two games of the year. This was a divisional round game that did 40 conservatively. It's 13 more million people watch that. And also what was special about Michigan versus Alabama? It was in the Rose Bowl. It was for a place, the national championship. It was Jim Harbaugh against, you know, uh, uh, against Nick Saban, all that stuff. But like, you need to build to that. You cannot just do Clemson, Michigan, Alabama, Ohio State, like every single week. It's not going to be as special if you do it like that. I know people care about their stuff in the region. And here the thing is, like, it's not, it's, it's not going to be a full SEC. Like Mississippi State's not going to get like, you know, hung around in there. At least if they do, they're not going to get as much cash. It's going to be the top schools. If you want to go full Super League, like why are we just going to include Rutgers and 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 Purdue in there? Why are we just going to include Indiana and, and Illinois in there? They're just taking the check. That's, that's what they're doing. They're taking the check and they're taking the L's. Like, so what's the whole point of this? Is this going to be basically the Champions League in soccer where it's, hey, the top four clubs of you know in Europe uh, out of each country, you know, top four in England, top four out of France, top four out of uh, Spain, top four, you know, three out of Russia, all that stuff, like compete and play for the uh for the you know the champions league trophy it's gonna be like that right but the other thing about that is those domestic seasons for those teams are still going on they're still playing teams inside their own uh their own league their own country right so you know spanish teams will play spanish teams and then in the middle of the week they'll go and they'll play uh european uh, other european teams and that's great and that's fun that's why i like it but you can't do that for football because football is too violent and you can't play two games a week so you know, they have to figure out what they're going to do with this. And I, that's why I wear for the Big 12 is like, are you going to include them? And if you include them, how much money are they are going to get? Uh, I think it's a huge part of this too, because we're about to go to this 12-team playoff. But like you wonder how long are we going to be in this? How long can they hold it down? It's coming next year, but it f- still feels like everything can change very, very quickly. Uh, and I think that causes a lot of concern. And also the idea of getting Congress involved, my God. I mean, it just sounds awful. At least the Supreme Court's been pretty, you know, like they're pretty, and they have been very, very direct with this. And I think it's been a pretty bipartisan, at least uh, it's been my my sense, been very bipartisan in the Supreme Court with, with the support of the athletes and kind of siding on the athlete side on things. But, you know, anytime, uh, you know, you get, you get the government involved and stuff like this and look like, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying political issue at, at all. I mean, it's becoming a political issue, but like anytime you, you get Congress involved, I mean, we need them to sort this out. They can't sort themselves out. They can barely fund the government. Like, I mean, they've been fighting over spending bills in Congress for months and weeks now and years. You know, uh, if they can do that, how they can be able to get college you know, football fixed and taken care of. Kind of needs to take care of itself in some ways. But it also needs to think about what it is and be a good custodian of what it is. Like, history, tradition is what we like about it. You know, uh, you know, like, I think it's great that, and Missouri will play Missouri State, or Arkansas plays Arkansas Pine Bluff, or uh, you know, take your pick of a school plays an HBC. LSU plays Southeast Louisiana. You know, Florida A and M plays Florida State. Like that's what I want to see. I know those those games are blowout, but it's cool to see you know little schools in those states get supported by the big programs, and everybody comes together and watches those games. They're one way traffic, sure, but those kick off the season. So I, I like stuff like that. I think it should still be in football. I'm worried about the future of things like that if we keep going in this direction. All right, so let me know what you all think. Uh, Big 12, Brett Yormark, I'm sure he is worried. When it comes to basketball, not worried. I think that's something we'll tackle at a later date. We've been talking about it too, how basketball could save the football side of things. Last night in Big 12 hoops, though, a great evening. Have to say it was highlighted by a uh, top 25 game. It was Houston getting a 75-68 win. LJ Cryer goes for 23 points on 7-13 shooting. Uh, 75, 68, once again, on the road, Marriott center, right? Houston drops two in a row. They have now ripped off. I believe, what is it? Uh, back to back victories, three straight victories right now. Yeah. Three straight Texas tech. They beat at home. UCF, they beat at home and then BYU. They beat on the road. Kelvin Sampson's group. They're working right now. They look actually look like, you know, at least the last week and a half, the best team in the big 12, maybe. So a big win for them on the road. Texas goes to Oklahoma and gets a 15 point win. 50 from the floor, 44 from three, and 83 from the line. The only category really felt like they were, you know, big losers in was the um, 
uh, was the turnover category, but it didn't matter that much. They cleaned the glass really well, too. They were plus 16 in the rebounding category. And then uh, Max Asmus had a really nice night, 22 points. Tyrese Hunter was two for eight, tough night for him. But Desu and Asmus carry the load. They combined for 41 points in this game. And they were efficient, too, on 14 of 24 shooting from the field. So anytime you get an effort like that, it's good. And then Roddy Terry's team, which started off yesterday, or I think, let's see, yeah, yesterday morning, Joey Brackets had them outside. Uh, he had them, let's see, next four out. And in the span of now two games, Texas has collected two very strong wins, right? They have collected a win against Baylor at home, top uh, nine, no top 10 team. They beat OU on the road by 15. It's a top 15 team as well. So they're actually starting to you know rack up some quadrant one wins, which they need to do. Uh, and they get BYU on the road this Saturday. Then they come back home for Houston. So plenty of opportunities there. But the Longhorns back at 500 in the league. Rodney Terry's group is rebounded after their snafu against UCF and the horns down complaints. Uh, speaking of UCF, they get to three and three in the league with a 72 59 win rate break one battle. Uh, just being a joker in this game, getting ejected. I know a lot of folks were stirred up about that. That's obviously tough. And the defense did the rest of the job. This was not a fun game to watch. Uh, you know, let's see UCF shot 37% from the floor and West Virginia thought shot 36% from the floor. So just a kind of game that was I think, defined by the fact that West Virginia's best player was not in it for a large part of the game. And then also finally TCU gets a 74 69 win on the road over Oklahoma state who's now zero and six in the league. They kind of felt like this would be a workmanlike effort. They needed it to get back there to five uh, to 500 in the league. Emmanuel Miller, 21 points, 11 boards. He played all 40. Uh, he is now a star in this league, and that was a star performance. Uh, Avery Anderson, 15 points and four assists against his former team on six of nine shooting. Micah Peavy was 16 points on seven of 11 shooting. So they were efficient from the floor. They had a bad night from three, but ultimately it was their quality of shooting that took them over the edge. And Oklahoma State able to stay in it because they actually didn't shoot too terribly from three in this game. But TCU does get the win. They rallied in the second half. Tonight, there is one game on the docket in the league, and that is between K-State and Iowa State. It's Farmageddon basketball version. K-State right now is tied for the best record in the league right now at four and one. Uh, they are tied with Texas Tech right now is also four and one. And then you get KU and uh, Houston who are both four and two. And you get three and two, three and two at Baylor and Iowa State. So we'll see what happens in that. We'll preview a full weekend of Big 12 basketball coming up as well. All right, folks, that will do it for today's show. Make sure you follow us on Twitter slash X at NWPod365. You guys can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore. Find the show wherever you all want to get your podcasts uh, five stars in those places. And like the video, sub the channel, and let me uh, see your comments as well. All right, that'll do it. Talk to you folks tomorrow.